Thank you all for joining us. My name is Patty Arena, and I am the Assistant Director of Education and Outreach for Achievement Family Trust. Um, I would like to introduce Chuck Keenan and Ramey Harris, who are from Allegheny County Department. I'll let him introduce himself and tell you a little bit more about what he does. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Chuck Keenan. I work at the Allegheny County Department of Human Services. I've been here uh, close to 15 years, I think. Um, and I'm basically responsible for housing and homeless initi initiative at the Human Service Department. I work with a lot of partners, including the housing authorities and others, to try to assist our consumers. Ramey, you want to go? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ramey Harris. Uh, I'm also the Allegheny County Department of Human Services with Chuck. We're both in the Office of Community Services. Our work predominantly focuses on housing. Uh, my work is predominantly in the family space, so supporting families that are at risk of homelessness or are already actively experiencing a housing crisis. Today, we're going to really focus on providing an overview view of the available housing resources in our county. Um, we're going to talk about the different types of housing, where to find it, any eligibility questions you may have. Uh, we're also going to be discussing the eviction process, eviction prevention, and other rental assistance resources to prevent housing crises. And I'm also going to give an overview of the homeless services here in our county. Okay. So, Let's start with subsidized housing and affordable housing programs that are in our area. These housing programs in include public housing, which you may be familiar with, housing choice vouchers, also known as Section 8, uh, project-based subsidized housing, and low-income housing tax credit properties, which are another subsidized housing option that's available in our area. I'll start with public housing. Uh, these are the properties that are owned and managed by the housing authorities in our area. You may be familiar with some of them. Allegheny County Housing Authority, City of Pittsburgh Housing Authority, and the Keithport Housing Authority all operate in our area. Um, obviously, the City of Pittsburgh uh, Housing Authority encompasses the city limits. The county encompasses all the surrounding areas, and McKeesport is its own smaller jurisdiction in the McKeesport area. These uh, housing communities have units where the uh, rental housing is offered to tenants that meet these income restrictions. It is for lower income individuals, and tenants typically pay 30% of their income once their rent. Uh, the funding for these units is provided by HUD. The other option that is available that we'll talk about and really want to pump this up today are housing choice vouchers, which is the Section 8 program, as many of you know. These are permanent subsidies that stay with a tenant. A tenant would be issued a voucher that is for their household. This could be for a single individual or a family. Again, there are some income restrictions for these subsidies, but the voucher uh, provides a rental subsidy for a unit that is in the community that is leased by a private landlord in a location of the tenant's choosing. Uh, for these units, the landlord has to agree to participate in the program and abide by certain restrictions. Uh, Usually that means that the rental amount that they are charging for the unit must be within the fair market uh, rent for that area where the home or apartment is located. And the rental property has to pass the housing authority's quality standards inspection to ensure it meets basic capability standards. The uh, good thing about a housing voucher of many things is also that it offers portability which means they can take this voucher and move to a different area or a different housing authority jurisdiction after a certain period of time. It's usually one year, and then they, this tenant can move to another area in the same place or even to a different state. They can keep that subsidy with them and use it elsewhere, which is Awesome. To apply for uh, Section 8 or housing vouchers in our area, this is typically done online through the housing authorities. Each one has their own process. Um, the county and city housing authority um, applications are typically available online. Uh, Matisseport Housing Authority, uh, when their wait list is open, you can apply in person. Um, there are some uh, preferences that are available. Chuck will discuss those a bit later. 
um, that may allow possible tenants to apply outside of the wait list period. One thing to note uh, when you do apply for housing, make sure you give accurate contact information so you can be updated when your status of your application has changed. I think this was my slide here. So um, there are a few uh, specialized vouchers that sometimes people can access even if the wait list is closed. These are usually vouchers that are uh, given to one or more of the housing authorities here in the in the county directly from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, that's HUD. So Section 811 is a specialized voucher that actually is kind of managed through the, the state Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency and, and given to the housing authorities. There are a handful of these left at uh, the Housing Authority of the City of Pittsburgh, but these are specific for people with disabilities under age 62. So uh, there's a referral form. If anybody needs, you can email me. Uh, but it's it has to come from a third party service provider who's familiar with a person's disability and can verify that disability and verify their housing status. Uh, people have to be either institutionalized or homeless or at risk of either of those two things to qualify for the 811. Uh, Mainstream is another similar uh, vouchers. There are a few of those at the housing authorities um, from time to time. Uh, they usually come out in like increments of 25 or 30 uh, directly from HUD. So even if the wait list is closed. Uh, a housing authority might have a mainstream voucher. Those are very similar to 811. They are for people with disabilities under age 62. So you can inquire about that with uh, the city housing authority, the county housing authority, or the McKeesport housing authority to see if they may have those. Family unification program is another specialized voucher that comes to the housing authorities from uh, HUD directly. These are for families involved with the child welfare system. So that may have a child out of the home. Uh, or would um, be at risk of having a child placed out of the home simply because of their housing situation. If housing is a is a problem for that family uh, and they are becoming either at risk of having a child placed out of the home or already have a child out of the home, this uh, voucher could help them. So these are referred from the Office of Child Welfare uh, or CYF office here in the county uh, to the housing authorities. So there's not really a way in for those uh, unless you're involved with child welfare. Um, but it's a special program we have for them. And then there's another one that's also controlled by the Department of Human Services called a homeless preference. Um, these are kind of set aside vouchers from the housing authority. Uh, there's about 25 per year that we get of these uh, at the housing authorities where we can uh, assist people who are experiencing homelessness uh, in our homeless programs now who, can tr who need to transition to a voucher uh, in order to afford their apartment after the homeless program ends. So uh, we have, a, a again, a handful of these uh, that, that are available to us. And these are available regardless of whether the Section 8 wait list is open or closed at the Housing Authority. So just know that if you have somebody you're working with who might have a specific issue or, or they're in a, one of these subpopulations, there might be a, a way to get them a voucher, even if the wait list is closed, like it typically is, except for this week at the city. And then uh, the housing authorities have what are called local preferences as well. So these are ways for people to move up the wait list if they're already on the wait list. So the housing authorities have a domestic violence preference, an elderly preference, a veteran preference, and a disabled preference. So if you are in one of those groups, typically you will move to the top of the wait list. Um, you still have to apply and get on the wait list like the city is doing right now. But if you're over 62 or if you're a veteran, when it comes time for them to sort the wait list and start offering units, those folks will be at the top of that list. But you have to be on the list in order to get the preference. So we talked a little bit about the Section 8 program. Um, they use what's called a fair market rent in those programs. So when Ramey was talking about the kind of the pillars of the program, she said, do you have to you know, have an affordable apartment? Um, this is the typical fair market rent in uh, the city and county right now. Um, so there are small area fair market rents based on zip code. Um, so this will give you an idea of what uh, a voucher will pay for. So if you have a one bedroom apartment, and want to live downtown in the 15222 zip code, you have to find something that's under, uh, including utilities. So the fair market rent is basically uh, set at the 40th percentile of the rents in the county or in that particular zip code. What that means is if there's 10 apartments available for rent right now, you'll have to choose basically from the four cheapest ones, and then the other six will be usually above the fair market rate. And so that's how they, they calculate what apartments you can and can uh, rent for with the voucher. Um, the next one. Um, so when you're applying for subsidized housing, uh, you, there's a number of different things you can expect. Um, first of all, you have to meet the eligibility requirements. So they'll, they'll double check your income. So 
uh, public housing program that Ramey described earlier, earlier that's 80% of the area median income. The Section 8 program and most of the other uh, programs that we'll talk about later are usually 50% of the area median income and below. So you'll have to provide third party documentation of your income, whether that's a Social Security uh, award letter, a pay stub, a veteran benefits, things like that. So they'll, they'll ask for that. You need all your documents like your Social Security cards or certificates. Uh, ways to prove who you are. You have to show your citizenship. Also have to follow their reporting requirements. So that includes updating that information, you know, on a yearly basis or when you're a person top of the wait list, they're going to ask you for the, that information to be verified again. And then your rent and in, in, uh, the Section 8 program, public housing program, and then the uh, next program that we'll talk about, which is the HUD subsidized programs, are based on your reported income. So anything that's funded by HUD, you're going to pay 30% of your adjusted gross income for rent. So they need to verify your income so that they can calculate your rent. Also determine your eligibility. Go to the next slide, please. Um, next project I'm gonna talk about is uh, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. This is a fairly new uh, program that started in, I believe the 1980s. It is actually funded by the Internal Revenue Service and not the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. These are tax credits that come to the state uh, Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency, and they are used uh, to afford uh, or to buy uh, tax credits from uh, investors or corporations who then sell those credits to the state to, to provide capital to build affordable uh, apartments. So you'll see like most of the new things that are built in the county that are affordable are built through this low income housing tax credit project. They typically are, you know, 40 to 50 units big, you know, they can be elderly only, or they can be for families. But the idea is that, uh, you know, a corporation will buy a tax credit to reduce their tax liability in exchange. Uh, that money then goes into the state's uh, low income housing tax credit project so that they can build housing. What's different about this program than the HUD subsidized program is that you may pay more than 30% of your income for rent. Uh, the rents are tiered and they're flat. So if you're at 50% of area median income or below, you might pay for, for a one bedroom apartment. Whereas, uh, you know, if you have $1,000 of income uh, and you were in a HUD subsidized place, you'd pay 300, but they qualify you based on your income. And then the rent is flat from there. Uh, based on the tier that you're in. And they have different tiers based on different income levels. So they have rents for 20% and below area median income, 50%, 80%, things like that. So I'm going to go on to the next one. And then, so project-based subsidized housing is just another form of subsidized housing. So when, when Ramey started the presentation, she talked about public housing, Section 8, project-based Section 8, which is this one here, and then the low-income housing tax credit program. So project-based Section 8 are, are direct grants from HUD to uh, usually nonprofit developers, and they will uh, use that money to build uh, subsidized property. And then they typically have a 30 year compliance period where they agree to provide uh, that apartment to somebody who's low income for the next 30 years or so. Um, there are over 200 of these properties throughout the, the county, uh, throughout Allegheny County. Oh, it's good to know about these is the subsidy stays with the unit. So if you move into that apartment, you pay 30% of your income for rent while you're living there. But if you move out, you don't take that subsidy with you. The Section 8 program that Randy talked about earlier, that's a mobile voucher. So whatever, as long as you have that voucher, wherever you go, you will pay 30% of your income for rent. These, the subsidy is attached to the unit. So like I said, there's over 200 of these throughout the county. They're managed by people like Action Housing and Presbyterian Senior Care and the old ARCO uh, properties. Brandywine has a number of them. So we have a list of these uh, at the county now, uh, and we can share that with you afterwards. But basically, just know that when you move in, you'll pay 30% uh, of your income for rent. And then uh, if you move out, you're going to go back to paying with the mortgage list and whatever that unit is that you move. Yeah, um, this is just a recap of the documentation and vital records that are required um, to apply or to be accepted into housing at any of these um, different types of affordable housing units. You'll have to provide proof of your identity, citizenship, and income. And this is for everyone in the household. So if it's a family of five, all of the adults and all of the children have to provide some proof of identity. Income employment is off, or income um, verification, records, things like that for adults are required. And that can be if it's earned income, unemployment income, if you're receiving any public assistance, um, all of that is required. And this is just uh, quickly how you can obtain 
that information. Uh, if you are looking to apply for housing or assisting someone who is applying for housing, uh, a good first step is to make sure that they have um, originals or copies of their vital records that are here, um, especially the birth certificates for children. Sometimes those take a bit of time for people to receive, especially if they're coming from different areas. So just to be mindful that these are required uh, for housing. After applying for housing, um, eligibility is determined by the housing authority or the property management company that is overseeing that community. The eligibility is based on the annual gross income uh, Chuck mentioned the different levels for each types of property that are required. Um, if you exceed that, you would be over income for those properties. If you are qualifying as a special population, elderly, a person with a disability, or as a family, and also your citizenship status. It is possible for what are referred to as mixed status families to apply for subsidized housing. Um, basically, if there is a household where, you know, one household member does not have citizenship status, but others in the home do, the uh, members of the family or household that have citizenship status are eligible for a subsidy, and the other person who does not have status has to pay um, basically the full rent portion um, based on the, the household occupancy. There are some uh, instances where someone may be found ineligible uh, permanently for a subsidized housing or anything in public housing. Um, that would include somebody who is a lifetime registered sex offender. There are different tiers of registration, um, and this tier is not permitted to except to subsidy, um, conviction of methamphetamine production on the premises of a federally funded, so HUD funded property is another one. And if someone owes a public housing authority money, if they were previously housed there and have some rent floor years, I will say, uh, even though these things may result in denial, especially owing a public housing authority money, there are things you can do to remediate that situation. Um, you can always appeal a denial decision. Uh, this is helpful if you are able to, you know, provide a little bit of background on the situation, what happened, and actively work towards paying off money that is owed to housing for me is something we often suggest doing. And sometimes people are able to appeal that denial of housing and be found to be eligible after going through that process. Um, all of the housing authorities and properties have an appeal process and hearings that are conducted that are um, fair and reasonable for everyone who may be looking to appeal a denial they may have received. These are common reasons for um, denials uh, in addition to those other, you know, owing money and um, be a registered offender. Um, they do a full criminal background check and also an eviction history check. Um, all of that information is public and available um, through our court portals. So if you are applying for housing and maybe you don't remember your rental history or you're working with someone who may not be sure, you can always check that information yourself to be aware of any things that may pop up when you're going through the application process. Um, another reason for denial may be not providing all of the documentation that was required with the application. Some housing authorities require that documentation up front with the application and others will request it when you are moving up on the wait list and they pull your application. They will then ask for your of, you know, income, your identity documents, the things like that. And if you're not able to produce them at that time, you may be denied. Another thing that is common um, when people are applying for housing, they may list a mailing address that is no longer a, a place they can receive mail. So they may miss out on an apartment offer or other opportunity that could be sent out to them. So it's really important to always update your contact information, make sure your mailing address is correct when you're submitting applications and you can always follow up with a, a property management office or the housing authority to update that contact information. Um, some properties also look at credit. Again, these are all reasons that you can appeal a denial for and advocate for yourself or assist someone 
by advocating for them to be offered a housing unit. Um, if you demonstrate some growth or change since uh, whatever contributed to that criminal history or poor credit occurred. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Space bar wasn't working. Um, so I uh, want to talk quickly a little bit about like what's appropriate for somebody in subsidized housing and when should you be looking at market rate housing. So subsidized housing is, is typically for people who are unable to afford uh, the market rates in the county. So if you're low income or very low income, subsidized housing is is an ideal place for you to, to look for housing. It's usually um, waitlist, uh, so there, there might not always be availability, but at least in terms of getting into uh, one of these apartments that are subsidized, you're going to always have an affordable rent uh, to pay. And if your income goes down, for instance, if you have unsteady uh, em employment or your hours fluctuate a lot or your pay rate fluctuates a lot, or you have seasonal work, you know, that's really good for, to be in subsidized housing because if you have these periods of time where your income goes down, they will adjust your rent uh, so that it, um, you're still going to pay something that's affordable. Um, so I want to go, I saw something in the Q&A earlier about like if you don't have any income or if you're homeless, are you able to live in subsidized housing? Uh, answer to that is yes. Do you pay rent based on your income? So if you have no income, you, you'll have no rent. Some projects have a minimum rent that might be $50 or $75 that they'll ask you to pay. Uh, but if you have a hardship uh, or you would still have the inability to pay that, you can ask for what's called a hardship and they may reduce your rent down to zero. So if you're in subsidized housing and if you have a $2,000 a month income right now, you know, you're know you going to pay 30% of that. But if you're all of a sudden you lose your job, you don't have any income anymore, your rent's going to go down substantially, maybe all the way to zero. If you do have stable income and you have a higher amount of income, uh, that's good to be in the market. You don't necessarily need to be in subsidized housing, but you should always still try to find something that's affordable for you. Kind of good rule of thumb for us is that you shouldn't be paying more than 30% of your of your income on housing costs, and that would include uh, utilities, property taxes, if you have to pay property taxes, if you own your own home, things like that. Um, and you could probably go up to near 50%, but once you get over 50% of your income towards housing, you're really going to be housing uh, burdened, uh, and there might be opportunities for for you to to struggle on uh, on paying your rent or you know be, be, being able to meet your other basic necessities. Um, I'll go to the next slide. So we'll do a, a couple minutes on fair housing. I think this will be important for you guys. Uh, probably the biggest complaint in fair housing right now is, is disability related. Um, so we're seeing a lot of people who are being discriminated against based on their disabilities, at least in terms of the fair housing complaints we're seeing in the county. So this is important, I think, for you guys to know. But basically, the, the Fair Housing Act was passed in, in the 1960s and amended in 1980 to basically bar um, discrimination, the rental, sale, or financing of housing. So things that are covered by the Fair Housing Act are, are renting or buying a house um, or a condominium or an apartment even a mobile home, the terms and conditions of rental agreements and sales agreements. So covenants that used to be in deeds and things like that are no longer permissible. There's a requirement now to, to provide reasonable accommodations or modifications for people with disabilities for them to be able to enjoy their, their housing. Uh, that might mean that um, a landlord has to allow you to make a modification to your, to your rental apartment. And if that modification is necessary for you to be able to get in and use the apartment, mortgage, lending, appraisals, and insurance are also covered by this as, as is advertising um, for apartments. So, you know, it's illegal to say, you know, uh, no kids uh, in my apartment building. You know, if you have a two-bedroom or three-bedroom apartment, you know, there's some of those status that, uh, that you, that is covered by the, by the act. So, there's things in, in advertising that are even covered. So in terms of disability, so Fair Housing covers anybody with a disability. So that includes a person with a physical or mental impairment, which substantially limits one or more major life activities. Um, it also includes people that have a record of that or people that are regarded as having impairment. So even if you don't have a physical or mental uh, impairment or a disability, if a landlord or other person assumes you do, that might make you covered. So for instance, somebody might think you have HIV or AIDS, even if you don't, and they're trying to deny you a place to live because of that status, you can be protected. Uh, so it's illegal to discriminate based on those kinds of things. The next one. So reasonable accommodations are basically changes in, uh, in policies and procedures um, and rules around housing that allow somebody with a disability to enjoy uh, the use of a dwelling unit or uh, the common spaces or to be able to fulfill uh, the program obligations. 
So we see a lot of this around uh, assistance animals, uh, parking, having an extra bedroom for a caregiver or medical equipment, things like that. Those are accommodations that a landlord is uh, is supposed to make uh, to allow you to to live in an apartment. So you know, again, for instance, if you you know uh, had an injury and use a wheelchair or you're unable to walk long distances and you can request a parking space close to your apartment um, if it's related to your disability. Uh, a reasonable modification is actually a, a change in the a physical uh, condition of an apartment. So these would be like adding grab bars or you know putting a ramp in for a wheelchair, having strobe lights uh, for somebody who's deaf to hear a doorbell ring or a phone ring, um, things like that. So these are actual physical changes to the apartment building. So it depends on the kind of housing that you're in, who pays for this. If you are in subsidized housing, so that's project-based subsidized housing, low-income housing tax credits, or public housing, landlord actually has to pay for and make these modifications. If you are in private housing, including tenant-based Section 8 properties, you can request these accommodations. The landlord is supposed to allow you to make them, but the expense is, is on you as the tenant to make the modification. So if, again, if you're in subsidized housing, project-based subsidized housing, where the, the subsidy stays with the unit, the modification is to be paid for uh, by the landlord. If you're in private housing or even have a Section 8 voucher, then you, the tenant, pay for it, but the landlord is supposed to allow you to make those modifications. Let me go to the next one. Um, so just some kind of tips and things that people can't, can't ask for and can't ask for uh, that do and don't violate the Fair Housing Act are, are kind of here. Uh, you always have to comply with your lease, regardless of your status as having a disability, race, gender, whatever, you know, if, as long as the lease is legal, you have to comply with that lease. A landlord can't assume that you're not going to be able to comply with the lease because of one of the protected statuses. But if it gets basically gets to the point where you don't, you're not able to comply with the lease, then uh, they can start to ask questions about that. So just know that they can't really ask the nature or severity of a disability, anything about the medications you take. Uh, they can't ask to see your medical records or to talk to your doctors. They may ask for third-party documentation to connect a request of yours, especially if it's a reasonable accommodation or reasonable modification to connect the disability with the request that you're making. So for instance, a doctor or a therapist or somebody that you're that a tenant is working with might write a letter that says, you know, uh, my client Joe Smith I recently had a heart attack. He's unable to walk a long distances. He is likely to have this impairment for the rest of his life. Can you please assign him a parking space near the building? They don't have to disclose a medical condition or anything that's underlying that. They can just say that the uh, inability to walk a long distance is good enough and then connect that uh, disability to what you're asking for. So uh, that's kind of how that works. I go to the next one. So this is an iterative process uh, requesting reasonable accommodations. It's basically, like I said, has to be done by the tenant. The landlord is not just supposed to know that you need an accommodation. So as a tenant, you're supposed to ask your landlord for an accommodation. They basically go into a kind of a discussion about that. A uh, landlord can ask for verification uh, and other things like I just explained about connecting the disability to the request. Um, but basically, you know, as long as a tenant makes a request, if it's not an undue uh, financial or an administrative burden on the landlord, or if it wouldn't fundamentally alter the nature of the housing providers program, it's supposed to be granted. So these are done on case by case basis. So things that are like not reasonable would be, you know, asking your landlord to provide you with a computer so that you can read emails uh, in your apartment because you know, communicate mostly through through email and not over the phone. Landlords don't typically provide that kind of assistance. They don't typically provide computers. Uh, it would be on you to do that. It would be on the landlord to provide you the wiring and other things that would be necessary to use the computer. So basically you can ask for accommodations that are related to your disability, but they have to be typically provided by a landlord and related to the program and then not be an undue or financial administrative burden. All right, go to the next one. Assistance animals is probably the biggest uh, area where uh, there's confusion and probably the biggest source of complaints that we're seeing. So assistance animals are basically different under the Fair Housing Act than they are under the ADA. So there's been a lot of kind of restrictions posed on assistance animals and, and companion animals under the ADA. The Fair Housing Act is a, is a little bit different. It's not as strict um, from the client standpoint. 
as the ADA is. So there's no certification requirement. Uh, there's not a lot of other requirements that need to be provided that you might have to do with the ADA. Uh, but, you know, it can't be limited to dogs or, or cats or other things. So the animal basically has to, you know, help you meet your quiet enjoyment of the apartment. And so basically, as long as the animal uh, is needed to, to help you with your disability and to allow you to enjoy the apartment or the home that you're in, it's considered an assistance animal or a service animal. There are things that landlords typically ask for around pets that are not required under assistance animals because assistance animals really aren't pets. They are animals that are needed to help you enjoy your apartment or, or home. So they don't have to be trained. They don't have to be certified. They don't have to have special rules placed, placed on them. But you do need to know that, you know, your animal has to comply with the lease. So if they start to bite, if they, if you don't clean up after them, if they do damage to the apartment, they might start asking for funds to repair the apartment, ask you to make sure that the dog doesn't bite, that, they, that you clean up after them, things like that. So just know that the animals are supposed to be, assistance animals are allowed and required under the Fair Housing Act. Um, they really, the landlord really can't pose any other like restrictions on them, but they can ensure that you uh, comply with your lease. Okay, next one. Just kind of one other little nuance in the, in the Fair Housing Act is there. Yeah, I mentioned familial status earlier, so um, it's illegal for for landlords and others to to say they don't take families except for uh, this special designation for housing for older persons. Um, so there is a rule that kind of gives an exception under the Fair Housing Act that allows uh, for the creation of more or less elderly only uh, properties uh, so that there can be retirement communities or people for that are specifically for people over 62 or over 55. And it's just kind of a carve out of the Fair Housing Act. So these are pretty much the only uh, groups of people that can can restrict a housing based on age or uh, familial status. So there's a couple different organizations here in Allegheny County that uh, if you think you're been discriminated against in terms of your housing that you can call. Uh, Fair Housing Partnership of Pittsburgh is a good place to start. Um, they may uh, end up calling HUD, uh, which is the compliance agency in, in charge of enforcing the Fair Housing Act in, uh, in the United States. Uh, but you can also call the Human Relations Human Relations Commission within the city of Pittsburgh or within the state of Pennsylvania. So all these numbers are here. Calling any of these is basically uh, equivalent. So if you call the Fair Housing Partnership, you don't necessarily need to call HUD. You can, but if you make a complaint to any of these four, uh, that complaint should eventually find its way to, to HUD. So you can call them directly or you can work more locally with like the Fair Housing Partnership or one of the Human Relations Commission. I think we'll skip this uh, homeownership program piece. Uh, I did want to let you know that the three housing authorities here in the county have a home ownership program. Typically, you have to be on the, in the Section 8 program or in the public housing program to access those, but you can use your Section 8 voucher, for instance, to help you purchase a home rather than pay rent to a landlord. So just know that if you're interested in that, those programs do exist and wouldn't have to ask about them if you think that they might be good. All right. Uh, we're now going to jump into eviction prevention and the actual process of eviction. Eviction is the process that allows a landlord or property manager to remove a tenant from a rental property. Um, this is not something that can be done overnight or quickly. There are several steps to it. Um, so it's helpful to be aware of that process how it looks and the steps you can take to prevent it from falling through. Um, in our state, landlords can file for eviction for three reasons. And if a tenant does not pay rent as agreed in their lease, if the lease has expired and does not automatically renew and they would like to remove that tenant from their property, or if the tenant has violated other terms of the lease that they signed off on and, and agreed upon at the time of the lease signing. So to prevent an eviction, there's some general things you can do throughout your tenancy, um, obviously abiding by the terms of your lease. There may be certain stipulations in there, and that can include uh, not having unauthorized tenants in the house and not having people join your home without having them added to your lease or following the, the visitor's policy that is outlined in your lease budget so that you can make sure you can afford your rent each month and you're not accruing rental arrears um, because the housing is unaffordable.
affordable for you. This is especially important for people who are living in market rate units. Um, so their rent is not based on their income and it's a static flat fee every month that, as Chuck said, should not exceed 40% of your monthly income. Anything more than that kind of becomes an undue burden on your household budget and leaves a lot of people in a situation where if they are living paycheck to paycheck and the crisis occurs, um, their housing costs may not, you know, supersede the other, you know, emergencies that may happen that may pose other financial burdens to them. So they may fall behind in their rent. So it's really critical to stay on top of your budget. It's also important, obviously, to understand the eviction process. Sometimes people are illegally evicted from their properties. Maybe their landlord is strong, suggesting that they leave, even though they still have an active and valid lease agreement. Being aware that you cannot be asked to leave your home in three days because the landlord wants to rent out to someone else at a higher price is really important. Uh, the landlord has to follow the legal process for this to occur. We're also going to talk about you know what that process looks like and some ideas and resources that are available to intervene uh, if you need financial assistance or mediation with your landlord to prevent an eviction from occurring. Again, these are the reasons that you can file for an eviction here. Sorry, I'm trying to answer some questions in the chat. Too. So the notice to quit. So the eviction process in, in the county in the state of Pennsylvania is, is fairly complicated and complex. Um, the big takeaway I think you should have from this is that if you get a note from your landlord or something on your door, uh, that is not the end of the process. That is the beginning of the eviction process. A lease is basically a legally binding contract between a tenant and a landlord. And really only a court can determine whether that contract has been broken. So a landlord cannot change the locks without going to court. They cannot, you know, uh, ask you to leave. Well, they can ask you to leave, but you don't have to leave. Um, just because you have a lease violation, you have to go through this process. So um, typically this starts with a, what's called basically a posting uh, or a notice from your landlord that you have violated some provision of the lease. Typically, this is unpaid rent. So a landlord has to give you notice that that they have found you in violation of this specific provision of the lease. So I have to send you a notice. It's March 10th. You haven't paid your March rent yet. You're in violation of the lease. Please leave my property. There's typically a, a notice period in that, which is like seven days for rent might be 30 days for others or 10 days for different other parts of the lease. Um, if you do not correct that violation as a tenant within that time frame, then the landlord has to go to court. Uh, typically here in Pennsylvania, it's the magistrate court uh, in, the, in the area where the property is located. And then they have a hearing in front of the magistrate. So the notice requirements are basically for rent. They have to wait at least seven days, uh, or I'm sorry, 10 days from the time of the of the notice given to you as a tenant before they can go to the magistrate. Uh, if it's a, another breach of lease term, it's typically 15 days. If you're in subsidized housing, it's 30 days. And then if it's an end of lease term, it's either 15 or 30 days, depending on how long you've been in the apartment. So that is the, the first step that they have to do after they've given you a notice uh, that you've been in violation. If you haven't corrected the violation from the time that notice was given to you to these 15 or 10 or 30 days after that, then they have to go to the magistrate and then you'll, they'll have a hearing in front of the magistrate. That is usually scheduled seven to 10 days from the time uh, that the landlord requests the hearing, um, but that is the opportunity for, for you to either correct the, the lease violation, lead your case, you know, argue in front of the judge as to what might have happened there. So again, the process is basically notice from the landlord that something is, has occurred that uh, is in violation of the lease. You have some time to correct that notice. So if you if you need a couple of days to collect money to to uh, to pay your rent, or you haven't been paid yet from your job, you know you might be able to correct that. If you don't correct that within the time shown on the notice, then they go to the the uh, magistrate judge. Even if you lose a magistrate judge, there's still um, an ability to appeal to a common pleas uh, judge. And then the court common pleas judge will make a ruling as to whether uh, the lease has actually been violated and the person needs to leave. And then finally, there's a, what's called ejectment, which is when a constable comes in and executes an eviction on somebody. So that whole process can take anywhere from 45 days to upwards of a year, depending on how far somebody wants to appeal. So again, from, from your standpoint, as, as case managers and others that are working with, with tenants, 
just because you get a notice from a landlord uh, doesn't mean you have to leave. Uh, there's a video that probably shouldn't show, but we can send the link to you guys afterwards uh, that we've made. It's a little five minute video about the process. Uh, and the whole thing is geared towards basically, you know, making sure that people don't leave too early when they have uh, an eviction. Uh, and they, you know, they uh, take every uh, appeal uh, and every right that they have under the state law to, to prolong that and to correct any violations so they can stay in their housing. Okay. Um, we can skip the video, but we will include it afterwards. If we could have a time check, that would be helpful. Is yeah. the, are we nearing all of us? I think you're going okay, Rami. We're about halfway back. Okay. These are just some suggestions um, to be a good tenant in the property. A lot of these things will be spelled out in your lease agreement, um, like taking care of the physical space in the unit. Some of these things are obvious to some of the, uh, some of them aren't. Some people aren't familiar with living on their own, may not have the skills to maintain a property, might be their first living experience independently. So it's very important to do general maintenance in the home, uh, cleaning up, to taking out the trash, making sure you're maintaining the grounds outside to prevent any pests from entering the home. Um, if there are issues in the house, making sure that you are submitting requests to the property management company or landlord promptly so issues can be fixed before they turn into larger issues. Being respectful of your landlord and neighbors, um, there are certainly some provisions in lease agreements that can have you evicted for social violations, getting into confrontations on the property, things like that. Always read your lease agreements. Uh, be aware of what you're signing. Uh, as we mentioned, a lease agreement is a mutual contract between you and that property manager or landlord. So in exchange for you having a safe and habitable home, the landlord will spell out what they are expecting from you in return. This can include things even like lawn maintenance and snow removal. Um, so just being aware of what you are responsible for as a tenant is helpful. And you should not sign off on a lease if you do not feel you can abide by everything that is outlined in that lease agreement. Um, you can always ask questions and ask for permissions to be made or changes if you feel they are reasonable and appropriate. And definitely really be mindful of your budget. If you were looking at market rate housing in the community, a lot of it is quite unaffordable for folks who are, you know, middle income, even upper middle income in some areas. So you should look for units that are affordable for your regular income. So we say no more than 30 to 40 percent. Sometimes that is not attainable in the city limits. You may have to be a bit more flexible with where you're looking for housing as long as it meets your needs and is accessible for other things in your life. You know, if you need to that be close to public transportation, there are a lot of considerations to take into account when you're looking for housing, as well as the utility expenses. Um, most rentals don't include utilities. Some of them do. Um, but before you sign a lease agreement, making sure you're aware of what utilities you're responsible for, if the landlord is paying any of those utilities, um, some do include water, for example, just making sure you're able to budget those into your monthly expenses and always pay your rent. There are some instances where people feel they may not want to pay rent because something may be wrong in the unit. Um, there is a process um, to mediate issues with the home and not paying rent um, can only contribute to your own housing instability. So we encourage you to pay your rent, address issues with the landlord right away. If there are issues with you maybe being late on the rent or you need to make some sort of payment arrangement, be open and honest with your landlord so they're aware of the situation and seek assistance before it gets too late. Um, because this kind of tends to snowball where someone may be behind one month, they don't see anything, the next month comes around, they're already behind, maybe they're paying a little bit extra, but not quite enough, and they haven't really updated the landlord. Um, most people are very flexible and understanding. We all know life happens. Uh, unexpected things happen that may impact your ability to pay that rent. And having that open and honest relationship with the landlord can really go a long way with 
preventing um, something like a, you know, a notice being posted, um, if you can offset that and work out a payment arrangement, it's really helpful. I'm going to now jump into uh, going through homelessness and our resources that are very available to our county. I know it can be a little daunting for people to figure out where to start when they're facing a housing crisis. I'm going to start by explaining what the Allegheny Link does and how that is basically the entry point into our homeless services in the county. The Allegheny Link is the coordinated entry access point for our county, meaning it is the front door to our homeless services. If this is how you access uh, emergency shelters, get housing resources, and um, get connected to services that will help with housing needs, and that includes you know, finding utility assistance or all financial resources, things like that. Um, we have a coordinated entry portal here uh, to make sure that everyone has fair and equal access to services. Uh, this is also a way that folks can be quickly assessed for their needs and connected to assistance based on those specific needs. So it's catering to their specific situation and what resources and supports they may qualify for based on their unique situation. Calling into the Allegheny link does require sharing a lot of information and that information sharing occurs so that they can best help you. They do have a, a good bit of uh, access information or able to pull things together, but it's really helpful to share relevant information so they get an idea of the full picture and know how to guide you um, during that call. The Allegheny Link did start as an information and, and resource center for people who have disabilities or are aging. So they are trained to identify and connect people to resources. And that's in addition to being the access point for homeless services and affordable housing resources here. Previously, they were also managing eviction prevention resources, but there is a new collaborative that is handling that. But the Allegheny Lane can still assess eligibility for those programs too. When someone does call into the Allegheny Lane for housing assistance, uh, a service coordinator will speak with them and collect some basic information so you can see their demographic information, household composition, if there are any disabilities in the home, what the income is, if that's changed recently, and if they are connected to any other supports um, that they can be reconnected to. At that time, they're going to be screening and addressing any needs related to Homeless services, if that person needs to be connected to affordable housing resources, maybe they need assistance searching for housing, um, they can conduct like a tailored housing search for an individual um, and also connecting them to the right people if they have delinquent rent issues, need eviction resources, or are eligible for first month's rent assistance or other uh, financial assistance for housing. It is not always necessary to reach out to the Allegheny Link, though it is beneficial for people who may not be able to navigate our online resources. We do have a wealth of information available on the Allegheny Connects website. There are a lot of tools and documents on looking for housing, all of the eviction processes we discussed, the videos that uh, are about eviction are up on there so people can be informed of their tenant rights. So all of that stuff is available. Sometimes it's helpful to just talk to a human and have someone work through your issue with you and hear what's going on and talk through all of the available options with you. Um, so it's not necessary to reach out to the link to get, you know, a shelter listing for single shelter or housing search, but they can do it. Um, it is absolutely necessary to reach out to the link if you are part of a family with minor children that needs to access emergency shelter. All of the family emergency shelters, exclusive of the domestic violence shelters, are accessed by the Allegheny Link. So you have to call in to get access to those shelters. This is also the way that you can call in if you're a single individual 
who may be transient or experiencing street homelessness, you can be connected to the field unit, which is the a mobile access point for people who are out in the community and need to get connected to these kind of resources, but may not have the means or ability to get connected on their own. So the field unit is actually out in the community meeting with people there. The link also conducts all of the assessments for our homeless housing programs. And there are certain eligibility requirements that I would make someone eligible for those uh, programs. I'll get into that in a little bit. And again, uh, there are some resources for people who are looking for rental assistance, like first month's rent and security deposit, if they meet not having a safe place to sleep that night that you are calling in for assistance. Our definition of homelessness is different than the definition that is used by the school system, which is set forth in the McKinney-Vento law. That law is a little more flexible and also includes um, individuals who are double enough or couch surfing and staying with natural support to friends and family, but don't have a safe place of their own to stay that's consistent. These are the two main areas of homeless prevention that coordinated entry can assist with. Uh, one being eviction prevention, which is connecting you to financial resources to help with delinquent rent payments. And the other is rental assistance to help with those upfront costs. If you are in the process of either losing your housing and looking for new housing, that's that rental assistance piece. Not everyone is eligible for that, but the link service coordinators are able to screen you and guide you in the right direction to look for those financial resources in the community. When calling in for a homeless prevention assistance, um, there are some specific eligibility questions that are asked. Uh, to see if you are eligible to receive that assistance. They are going to definitely assess the status of your current housing situation to see at what point you are in the eviction process, if you've received a notice, if you are behind in rent, how behind are you in rent, why is that occurring, um, is this a temporary change in income, loss of income, uh, what occurred that resulted in owing the, the rent. If you are eligible for eviction prevention, they can do a warm handoff to the Allegheny Housing uh, Stabilization Collaborative, which is operated by Action Housing. Uh, the address there on the screen is their in-person office where you can go in person, you can email them, or you can call them for assistance. We recommend going in person if it's you know, so this is a new thing, or if you're really further along in the, the timeline, a lot of this assistance takes a while uh, just due to the demand. So it's helpful the, the sooner you can get out to talk to someone, the better. If someone is not yet eligible for um, eviction prevention funds or the situation has a little bit more nuance, the service coordinator can also troubleshoot whatever that specific housing situation is and offer connections to other resources that make sense for the situation. Same thing for rental assistance. They're going to ask a bit about your current housing situation. This is typically geared for people who are at risk of homelessness and in the process of securing other housing. And they're, you know, going to ask you some specific information on the, the unit, where it's located, if it's affordable, if you can uh, afford it based on your income, requesting proof of income. And that, depending on your situation, if you are actively experiencing homelessness or if you are stably housed at that time will determine if you qualify for any homeless assistance funds or other general financial services. Um, there are some other resources that you can be connected to when you're calling in to the Allegheny Link that can better meet your immediate needs. The, the field unit is that mobile unit that does street outreach for folks who are having unstable housing situations or maybe experiencing street homelessness. Um, they're able to step in and help people with their basic immediate needs, but also connecting them to supportive services at like behavioral health, if they need physical health or other connections to vital services that may help better their situation and can obviously discuss housing needs. The other main resource for the folks who are having a housing crisis is emergency shelter. And this is what is available for people who do not have a safe place.
place to sleep that evening that they are reaching out for assistance. Um, in our county, we, we often get questions about emergency housing, which is not something that we have in our area. We do have a pretty robust emergency shelter system, and that would be for single individuals. And we also have the family emergency shelters that are for families with minor children in their care. Um, if you are a single adult or transition age youth, the traditional shelters available are typically walk-in or self-referrals. You do not need to reach out to the Allegheny Link to access those shelters, though they can uh, help you work through which ones may have vacancies and do a warm handoff to those shelters. Uh, family shelters or families with minor children of any composition, any parental arrangements, um, must contact the Allegheny Link uh, for connection to those emergency shelters. So they are often at capacity. Uh, we recommend families contact the link daily. And service coordinators will discuss all of your natural supports that may be available to you and try to troubleshoot through some other ways that you can self-resolve your homelessness for that evening. If you are not able to find a safe place to stay, that is when you would be deemed eligible for emergency shelter. And if there is space, they can accommodate your family. The Allegheny link would make that connection for the family. This is a listing of the shelters for single adults in our county. And at the lower left, there are also three uh, domestic violence shelters. And those are for anyone, regardless of identified gender, that are fleeing domestic violence or intimate partner violence. We can also send this listing out, but this just gives an overview of how accessible those shelters are, where they're located, and contact information. And this is, again, also available on the Allegheny Connects website. As far as the family shelters, we do have six in our county. Uh, they are spread out throughout the region. There are some in the Mon Valley area. There are three there. There are a few within city limits. One is in Uptown and one is in East Liberty, and there is one in the Allegheny Valley area. So they are everywhere that, you know, uh, people may need, though, if you are offered shelter space, there's no way to kind of select one that you go to is basically based on the availability of each of those shelter providers. Um, I was going to talk about this a bit, but just to give a general overview, for people who are actively experiencing homelessness, meaning they are in an emergency shelter, um, staying on the streets, if they are hospitalized and will be discharged to the street within a day, or if they are actively fleeing domestic violence, they are able to be assessed for homeless housing programs. Those programs are, you know, not um, a, it's not a quick process, and most folks are not eligible for or able to access those programs, but some are, and it's based on need and a vulnerability assessment that's conducted at the time of assessment. Yeah, so if, if you need emergency housing, you need to call the link. Other than that, you should be applying for subsidized housing, other affordable housing programs that we talked about. And you just go on the wait list and you have to wait until your name gets to the top. Uh, there's not really any emergency housing other than through the link and you have to be street homeless to get that. Typically. Right. And again, that is emergency shelter. Um, we do not have housing units we can place people in. I know we, we get a lot of calls about people looking for emergency housing, but uh, we have emergency shelter, uh, which is safe and stable. All the, you know, the shelters are safe. The family, I, I know there are a lot of concerns about the, the family shelters being huge congregate spaces, but we have um, a very nice, robust shelter system here for families that have private sleeping spaces, minimally shared facilities. So that is a first step if you do not have somewhere safe to stay for that evening. Ideally, uh, folks are working on getting their own housing while they're still out in the community and they don't have to go through the homeless system, but it is there for people who have no other options. I think we're done on our end. We'll, we'll still be here for questions if there's something after. Okay, so thanks for having me today. I am Sally Owen. I am the Director of Meeting Basic Needs at the United Way of Southwestern Pennsylvania. Um, I oversee the investments in our area of Meeting Basic Needs, which includes uh, 
our investments in housing programs. And so uh, this morning, I am mostly going to be speaking with you a little bit about United Way and what we do in our mission um, and some of those programs, those investments that we have. But primarily, I'm going to spend the bulk of my time speaking with you about the 211 24 um, hour hotline, uh, which will hopefully be able to serve as a resource for some of you. So, the United Way, the mission of, our, of the United Way is to improve the lives of our neighbors by mobilizing the caring uh, power of communities. And we do that by bringing together our entire community, and our region specifically is. Allegheny, Armstrong, Butler, Fayette, and Westmoreland counties. Um, and so we invest in organizations and programs that are working to create change and to address the challenges of our most vulnerable neighbors. And we do that by focusing on three key investment priorities, meeting basic needs, which um, is exactly what it sounds like, uh, programs that focus on things like food and shelter, moving families and individuals to financial stability, so helping folks with um, increasing assets. This could include home ownership. And then finally, building success for school and leg, which are youth-based and our education programs. Um, so today, my focus will really be on the meeting basic needs piece because this is all about housing. That's what we're here to talk about today. And so we do that by investing in programs that provide shelter, um, specifically transitional um, and supportive housing programs. We also partner with organizations that have eviction prevention programs um, that help people stay in their houses and homes, either by providing rental assistance, by providing landlord and tenant mediation services, resource navigation services, um, or that do home repairs and modifications. And then finally, there are um, a number of organizations that provide emergency financial assistance that folks can use for things like utility assistance or rental assistance, but also for those kind of unforeseen bills that come up, medical bills that maybe have been unexpected, car repair, um, funeral expense, something like that would prevent them from being able to use um, some of that income for rent or utilities. Um, and so by providing that emergency financial assistance for kind of those unforeseen emergency expenses, uh, folks don't have to make that tough uh, financial choice and can, can avoid a larger crisis. So these are some of the programs that we invest in. Action Housing, the Sustainable Home Improvement Program is a program that um, provides housing repairs and housing uh, modifications for people with disabilities and older adults. Our Family Links Community Connections Program um, supports young adults ages 18 to 24 um, using a housing first model um, to get them into maybe their first their first homes and to support them as they live independently for perhaps the first time. Just Mediation Pittsburgh is an eviction prevention mediation program, so works closely with landlords and tenants um, to keep them from um, having to go into the court system and provides those mediation services with trained mediators. They work closely with neighborhood legal services, um, who also provides pro bono legal advice, again, for folks who may be at the risk of being evicted from their homes. North Hills Affordable Housing is a program that serves um, single mothers who are survivors of uh, domestic violence, uh, provide transitional housing for them, and then help them find uh, permanent housing, as well as helping them meet their educational and career goals. Rent Help Pittsburgh is another eviction prevention program. This one works very closely with Just Mediation Pittsburgh and Neighborhood Legal Services. They do some resource navigation for folks who are at the risk of eviction. Um, they also work very closely with Housing Stabilization Center through Action Housing that was mentioned in the uh, previous presentation. Sisters PGH uh, is kind of a special uh, program that works with trans and mind 
non-binary folks who are at risk of addiction. They provide rental assistance, utility assistance, um, emergency financial assistance, and they also have a transitional um, and supportive housing program. The Veterans Place of Washington Boulevard is one of our few programs that actually works with um, unhoused populations. So they work with unhoused veterans and provide them with uh, specific supports, such as food, uh, career development, um, things like that. Sally, and, excuse, you, excuse me for one second. Your slides are not advancing on this side. Oh, they're not. So am I on, let's see, can you see that? Yes, I, yes, you just pulled up program investments, yes. Okay, thank you for letting me know that. Sure. Um, they are advancing on my computer, but I will have to do it a little differently. Okay, um, thanks. Sure. And then lastly on this list is the Women's Center and Shelter, which is preventing the program that we support specifically is preventing homelessness through expanded housing advocacy. And again, this is a program that provides support specifically for survivors of um, intimate partner violence, uh, helping them to find uh, permanent, stable housing um, that is safe and secure. So all of these programs and all of these organizations are able to be accessed via 211. And like I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation today, I am going to spend the majority of my time this morning really focused on 21. So 21, 24-hour um, human services hotline. Um, it's a resource that can be used by an individual um, to find services and resources for themselves. It can be used by caregivers. It can be used by service providers. What's uh, kind of interesting about it is that you are always connected to a skilled resource navigator, so a live person. The service is absolutely free. It is anonymous. It is confidential. And our resource navigators are trained specifically to um, ask excuse me, to assess uh, any needs that you might have and then find a program or organization that can specifically meet those needs based on where you live, based on what that need is, and any kind of specific program eligibility um, requirements. Um, if translation services are uh, necessary, if you speak another language um, else other than English, we do have immediate translation available in over 100 languages. And again, the service is available um, every single day of the year um, at any time of day. Um, so holidays, middle of the night, um, any time at all. Um, and you can access 211 either by calling, by chatting on our website, or by texting. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about how each of those works. Um, but essentially, it is uh, this extensive database. We have thousands of um, services in our database. I will say that our most, our top three uh, requests for services are always and very consistently housing, utilities, and food. But also at the top of that list um, are things like clothing and furniture as well as assistance with transportation, which could look anything like bus passes or gas cards or uh, people seeking assistance for uh, paying for things like car repair or uh, shell services, things like that. Um, but we also have listings for things like disaster relief, um, mental health and substance abuse services or programs, um, people who are seeking uh, legal um, assistance, uh, folks who are looking for employment services, and then um, veterans programming as well. So really almost anything under the sun that a human services or social services um, organization would provide, it's going to be listed in our database. Um, you can see here that this is just a map of uh, the state of Pennsylvania. Um, and this is just to illustrate that 211 is really statewide. Technically, it's it's nationwide. And so uh, no matter where you are calling from, you will be connected to a resource navigator um, that will able that will be able to um, assist you uh, in your in your area. 
Um, if you happen to be calling for someone else on behalf of someone else who may live in a different part of the state or even a different part of the country, our resource navigators can connect you by, uh, if all you have to do is say, I'm looking for assistance in, you know, in this zip code or in this, this city or this place, and they can connect you to that local two. Conversely, you could go onto our 211 website, UWW, and there is a link there to find a local 211. And uh, if you click on that link, it will prompt you to enter an address or a zip code, and then that will connect you again to your local 211 so that you can seek services um, that are appropriate to you. Um, so how do you get in touch with, with 211? I mentioned earlier, you can call, text, or chat. Um, so there's two ways to call. The easiest is just to, similar to 911. It's just a simple three-digit number that's meant to be easy to remember. But if for some reason that's not working, and in some cases, I will say that um, sometimes from cell phones, uh, you need to actually dial the full number. Uh, not always, but sometimes. And that number is, you can always text your zip code to 8 if you prefer to access services through a text. Um, and if you do that, you will be connected again to a live person. We do not use chatbots or AI, um, at least not yet. We're still using live people. So if you do text your zip code to, and you will be connected to a live person who can then assist you with um, whatever resources you need. Similarly, our chat is available on our local website, which is PA2. PA2 will get you to our webpage. Um, and the lower right-hand corner, there is a chat box where you can, again, um, chat with a live individual um, who can help you navigate resources. And then you also have an option to self-navigate. Um, so by going again to that PA2 website, you are able to um, search our database. You have access to the same database that our resource navigators have, and you are able to look for um, whatever services you may be seeking. And you'll be able to see, and I'll, I'll kind of go through this with you a little bit later. I'll show you what that website looks like. Um, but you can do that for yourself. You can do that on behalf of a client. You can do that for someone else. So um, it's a really handy tool if you want to uh, be independent and do it that way. But you always have these other options if you would like to be assisted by a resource navigator. So if you do call to what should you expect? So first of all, when you call, you are going to be provided with a menu of choices. Um, it's an interactive voice response, a system that we have set up. So if you are calling from Allegheny County specifically, if you will get a prompt that says to press one for taxes, we're currently in the middle of tax season and we are scheduling appointments for free tax preparation. So the menu will change uh, once tax season is over. But right now, if you call, uh, you would press one for taxes and number two for housing, three for Karen Connection, which is a juvenile justice position program. You would dial five if you live in Allegheny County and none of the previous prompts are relevant to you. Um, so if you're not calling about taxes, you're not calling about housing, you're not calling about Karen Connection program, um, you, would, you would press five for Allegheny County and then you would be connected to a resource uh, navigator who can specifically help you with any resources that are available in Allegheny County. If you need an interpreter uh, and need to be connected to those uh, language translating services, you would press eight. And then nine would be for anything else that hasn't already been listed. Um, and that would actually provide you with three additional prompts. One to uh, click on if, or sorry, to choose if you are a veteran and seeking uh, veterans services specifically. One, if you have children or infants in your household, so under the age of five, and then the last is general. So again, anything that hasn't yet been a uh, bump for you. So then your resource navigator um, who takes this call 
is going to ask you some basic questions, um, similar to how Rainey was talking about um, when you call the Allegheny link, they need some um, specific information for, from you in order to best assist you. The same thing happens when you call to. So um, the resource navigator will ask you why you're calling and, and what specific needs you're calling in regards to. They will ask you for your first and last name. They'll ask you for your phone number in case the call gets disconnected so that they are able to call you back and complete uh, the referral. They'll ask some demographic information such as your gender, your race, uh, your date of birth. They will ask for your veteran status, your preferred language, and then the makeup of your household, uh, specifically, again, whether or not there are children in the household or anyone under the age of 18. None of these questions are um, deal breakers if you decide not to answer them or don't feel comfortable answering them, or if you're calling on behalf of someone else and you don't have you know, all of that specific information, um, on behalf of that person, they will still do their best to help you. But obviously, the more information that they have, specifically around things like age, veteran status, will help them to make a more appropriate referral. So the referrals that they will make, of course, will be based on not only what you're saying that you're calling about, but your zip code, um, any eligibility requirements of that program, and so the resource navigator will then provide you with a list of uh, potential referrals. Again, depending on the specific program and the specific organization that they are referring you to, that may be more of a warm handoff where they uh, provide your information to that organization, to that program, and then that program will contact you. But in some cases, they will just give you a list of programs that will um, be able to meet your needs. And then you on your own um, can reach out to those programs at, at your uh, convenience. So I am going to do my best to see, I'm gonna try this and see if it works. I would like to show you what it looks like to navigate the 211 website, um, because I think it's useful to just be able to do this on your own if you are um, not wanting to call, text, or chat. If someone can just tell me, uh, uh, let's see. Okay, are you able to see? Yes, right, yeah, it says PA211, okay. Yeah. What Right. So this is if you go to PA211SW.org, uh, this is this is where it will take you. Um, you can see there are a couple of different places on this uh, on the screen that I that I want to point out to you. Uh, the first is at the bottom right hand corner. There's a little blue bubble that says live chat. Um, I'm not going to click on it right now because if I do, it'll connect me to a resource navigator and they are all busy. Uh, working with folks right now, so I don't want to take their time away from that. But if you did click on um, live chat, you would, like I said, get connected to a live resource navigator who would then ask you for your zip code, ask you a little bit of information about yourself through the live chat, and, and um, be able to help you uh, navigate some resources. If you would like to self-navigate, there's kind of two ways to do that. The first is at the top of the page where it says get help. And then the second is down towards the middle of the page where it says search services. And either of those, clicking either on get help or on search services will get you to the same place. And you'll get to this uh, page which says, what do you need help with? And once you're here, there's a couple of different ways to search. You can click on this red search bar, which will then turn blue, and you can enter keyword and agency name, your zip code in your city, and then you can search and it'll pop up. So I'm going to just put in housing. I'm um, in 15222 right now. Let's say 50 mile radius, and I'm going to press search. Sometimes this takes a little bit, but what happens is once I do that, you'll see that a ton of different resources will pop up. Now I just put housing, so you'll that's a pretty broad uh, term that I put in, which is part of the reason there are so many uh, things that pop up. If I had been a little bit more specific and said something like 
rental assistance or mediation or something like that, I would have gotten some more, a more limited list. So the more specific you can be with your search terms, the more you'll have relevant answers when, when different resources pop up. Just like if you were Googling, right? Um, if you just put housing into Google, you're going to have a lot more responses than if you are more specific. Um, but let's just look as an example at this Allegheny Housing Stabilization Collaborative. Um, so this is that housing stabilization center that we talked about earlier through Action Housing. Um, it gives you the physical address. It also gives you um, el any eligibility requirements. So in some cases, there may be programs that don't have eligibility and it would say, you know, no requirements. But here, um, this is listing that, you know, you have to be an Allegheny County renter with an active eviction proceeding or a completed mediation agreement um, through just mediation. So it's telling you, you know, what you need in order to access these services. Um, it provides you with the office hours that they're available, um, when you can call by, by uh, phone, when you can go in person, there's an email address, a phone number, and then if you are planning to go in person, how to get there. And then if you click on more details, it happens, it's not popping up there, but oh, here we go. It'll also give you other services that might be available at this agency. And then, you know, here's a map so that you can see exactly where it's located. So depending on the actual program, when you click on more, you may see additional information here. This gives you that intake procedure. It gives you the intake requirements. So what do you need to bring with you? So depending on the program, again, those, those will differ. Um, so that's one way to search for a service. The other way is if you know, instead of kind of typing in housing or um, the agency name that you're specifically looking for, you can also click on this housing and shelter icon. Um, and when you do that, that'll kind of bring you to this page, which will show you kind of what our top uh, requests tend to be. So people tend to be asking for um, assistance with payments. So if you open that up, you would see, you know, I need help with rental payments. I need help with a uh, rental deposit. If I was looking for uh, resources for subsidized housing, I could click here to look at what are the housing authorities, what's happening with Section 8 uh, housing choice vouchers. Um, and so depending on what your specific need is, is it a landlord-tenant dispute? You know, you would click on that and then you would put in your, again, your zip code or your city, county, and then they would, uh, it will pop up with different uh, providers. So you'll notice that because this was a little bit more of a specific search, we were looking specifically for programs that would help with landlord-tenant disputes. I have a much smaller list of agencies. Again, I can look at Neighborhood Legal Services Association. I can see here I would need to visit their website specifically, um, but I can do that directly through uh, this. I don't need to leave this website. Uh, I can click here and they will take me to the Neighborhood Legal Services uh, website um, so that I can see what their updated eligibility requirements are. Again, their office hours are listed. And then if I click on more details, I get a fax number. Um, I see if there's anything that I would need to pay in order to um, access these services. And then I also can see a long list of other services that this organization might be able to help me with. So um, I am going to stop sharing my screen now and I will take any questions that anybody might have about uh, 211 or the United Way. Yeah, and I think there were some questions that Maria was going to share with you, Sally. Okay, great. So, hi, Sally. Uh, it, it, there's someone who, who asked, uh, said the 211 phone number has not been working for a few weeks. Can you speak to that? Is that actually calling 211, like just calling 211 or is it using the full number with 1888? Um, I, I can't tell. Okay. Uh, it just says 211 phone number has not been working. For okay. Me. So then she just put yes, dialing to. Okay. So in some cases, and it's, it's, I'm not sure 
what the reasoning is for this. But in some cases, with you're using a mobile phone and you're just dialing 211, it won't necessarily connect you. And so in that case, you really do need to use that full um, phone number, which is the 888-856-2773. I can assure you that our resource navigators have been answering calls. Um, and so I'm not exactly sure what the problem is, but I would try that full 888-856-2773 um, number if just dialing 211 isn't working. Um, and if for some reason you're still having trouble getting through, um, again, you might want to try um, either using that live chat if you have access to the internet and, and the website. Or if you want, if we do have a mobile phone and you're able to text your uh, zip code to 888-211, I'm sorry, 898-211, um, you can uh, text with a live um, resource navigator. But I'm sorry that that hasn't been working for you. Someone asked how might a conversation shift if someone is calling for themselves versus calling in to assist others from someone for, from an agency? others say someone from an agency? Sure. Um, I mean, in terms of the kinds of resources that we would provide to you, they're going to be the same, whether you're calling for yourself or whether you're calling um, on behalf of somebody else. Um, it is helpful for us to know if you're calling on behalf of someone else. Um, in some cases, because uh, you may already have connected them to some other resources, you may already be working with them on certain things. Um, and in some cases, too, I would say that if you're an individual calling on behalf of yourself, and let's say you're calling about, um, you know, I need help with like an employment service. Well, through the conversation with the resource navigator, they may realize that the reason that you are asking for help finding a job is because you are unable to pay rent, right? And so they may then realize, well, let's kind of triage what um, the needs are of this person and um, help help connect you to maybe a rent assistance program or some other kind of program that can help you with the that housing need. Um, if we're talking to a service provider, in some cases, we're going to assume that that triage has already happened um, and that the need that the service provider is calling for is really the kind of top, um, most immediate need of that individual. So that might be one way that it would change. But generally, in terms of the kinds of resources that are being provided and those referrals, those are going to look very similar. Okay. And, and then um, someone else just uh, asked about services being free. Uh, just affirming that all of the, the services are free. So, yes. So the, when I say that they're all free, what I mean is when you call 211, there's absolutely no charge for you to call 211. And for us to assist you and connect you to a resource, um, that is absolutely free. You'll know when I was doing kind of my example, um, neighborhood legal services. In some cases, neighborhood legal services may charge a small fee or a sliding, a sliding scale. So not every single resource that we're going to refer an individual to is going to be free of charge. It really depends on that program and that organization. Um, that said, all of the organizations and programs in our database have been screened. Um, they are all, I don't want to say 100%, but I want to say like 99% of them are, are um are not for profit organizations. Um, so, you know, you can feel comfortable that um, the organizations that we are referring to you to have been vetted, but that does not necessarily mean that there's absolutely no fee. Um, we know that some nonprofits do charge small fee or a sliding scale. Okay. And the only other thing we had a request, someone from the Department of Aging, Area Agency on Aging for and uh, adult older adult protective services for um, training from both the the United Way as well as DHS on this information because I think she's suggesting they're using this information every day and it would be helpful to have some training. So I think not so much a question but a request. So yeah, actually, um, 
we certainly can do that through 211. I also just want to say when we send out the slides, um, I would also like to invite folks, we, we do something here that's open to the public. It's called a 211 experience. You do, you do need to register ahead of time, um, but it's an opportunity to learn a little bit more about 211. Um, and not it's not a repeat of the information I presented today, but really kind of dig deep dives more deeply into the kind of um, data that we collect and some of the a little bit more into the needs that we're seeing across the board but it's also a chance to listen in on some live um, calls and so i can send the information about that if any of you are interested in participating in the 211 experience again you would need to register ahead of time but we have them um, monthly and they're in our office uh, in the strip district um, where our call center is located. So that's another opportunity to learn a little bit more about 211 and the resources that we provide. And I think that's it for the questions. And so, okay. That was it. Thanks, Maria. And boy, thank you um, to our presenters today. This was fantastic information. I really appreciate all three of you, Chuck. Ramey and Sally for taking time out of your busy schedules to share this valuable information today. As a reminder, again, this webinar has been recorded and will be put up on our website. So if you need to go back and view it, um, please visit our website. We also have past webinars there as well as information on upcoming webinars if you'd like to, to register for those as well. So I did want to share um, with all of you just some um, programs that we have coming up as well if you'd like to again you could visit our website we have uh what are they here you go um on april 2nd we're going to uh dive into medicaid home and community-based waivers for people with disabilities and then on april 23rd we have a program on understanding the basics of ssi and ssdi so we really are getting back to the basics here at achieve a family trust housing is something that we always get questions on. And um, again, we're so appreciative of Chuck, Sally, and uh, Ramey sharing their time today to go over this information. So these are our upcoming webinars. And then just a couple of save the dates. If we have any attorneys in the crowd today, we are going to be doing a um, continuing legal education on June 5th. And then on October 9th, for anyone you know joining us today, we're going to be hosting our fourth annual future planning conference. It will be a hybrid event again with in-person at Allegheny Intermediate Unit, um, you know, and then you can view it virtually as well. And this will be on the basics of future planning. So I hope that you can join us for some of our upcoming programs. Again, we appreciate everyone's time and um, hopefully see you in a couple of weeks for our next webinar. Thanks again.